Before it was a canal, the Gowanus was a creek, a tidal estuary surrounded by a square mile of flooded salt marshes. Beneath the concrete and the sewers of today's Brooklyn, there are Dutch tidal mills and colonial farms of a once idyllic landscape. What most people don't know is that the Gowanus is also the site of the largest pitched battle of the American Revolution. It's really shameful that we have lost this key part of our history in this former swamp. Every school child in America should know the name of a former bog located on the southwest shore of Brooklyn, Gowanus. But the Battle of Brooklyn and the land beneath our feet have been lost to our imagination in some way. So for a moment, let's resurrect the land and these ghosts. So, it's March 1776. The British have just taken Boston at the Battle of Bunker Hill. But Boston is pretty useless strategically, and so they decided to make their next move. And the rebels anticipated. John Adams writes to George Washington, and he says, New York, as the nexus of the southern and northern colonies, is kind of a key to the whole continent. And from the British perspective, Long Island was the only spot in North America worth carrying on this war with any efficacy. With its fertile plains, you could feed an army for months without any support from England or Ireland. So it was pretty clear where the British were headed next. But the question is, where were they going to land? And how many people would they bring? No one could really know. They might go to the west coast of Manhattan, near 23rd Street, farther north, perhaps, near the Harlem River, or would they go to the shores of Brooklyn? And so Washington, perhaps foolishly, split his forces between New York, or rather Manhattan, and Brooklyn, with the East River between them. Now, in Brooklyn, on the heights of Columbia, which we today know as Brooklyn Heights, there was a hill, and it was the perfect vantage point for covering the strategically important East River. From this hill, you could see all of the water and lower Manhattan. And if you put guns there, it would be a perfect place to, to, uh, for artillery and for defensive protection of this land. And down south in Red Hook, Fort Defiance, another strategically important spot to cover the East River. Now, this peninsula that these hills were on was known as the Brooklyn Neck, the nexus of the village of Brooklyn, the Wallabout Bay, and the Gowanus below. And to the east was the Prospect Range, a series of hills that, ru that run from today's Bay Ridge all the way past Jamaica. And it was a perfect natural rampart for protecting the outer extremity of the Brooklyn Neck. At its most narrow point, Washington ordered an earth wall to be dug and built by local slaves and soldiers. And then finally, below it, was the impassable bog of the Gowanus Creek. Surrounded by salt marshes, it was the perfect natural protection that only an idiot would cross. Because when you have pounds of gear and a gun, you're not going to dive into a 20-foot bog. June 25th. 1776, the first wave of the British invasion sails into the harbor of New York. They immediately land on Staten Island and are followed by another wave and then another, the final bringing 8,000 mercenaries from the Hesse region of Germany. This tipped the scales, 32,000 British and Hessian forces in the Bay of New York. Compared to Washington, who only had about 14,000, he was completely outnumbered and, and had even less troops than he'd expected. He spread all of his forces between the Verrazano Narrows and all the way up to the Harlem River, but with the highest concentration in the Brooklyn Neck, about 5,500 men. Finally, August 22nd, 1776. The British frigates Phoenix, Rose, and Rainbow sail from Staten Island to today's Fort Hamilton, then known as Dennis's Ferry, and begin to shoot cannons into the hills. They do this to clear away the rebel presence. Then they land 75 flat bottom transport boats, 22,000 soldiers by 12 noon. This was the Brooklyn equivalent to the Normandy invasion. General William Howe, leader of the land force, British land forces in North America, had a strategy, and that was to take the Brooklyn Neck, hold the East River, and control the food supply. Washington had his forces prepared in the stronghold of the Brooklyn Neck. 
outside of the Brooklyn Neck in the prospect range. There were three passes where the Americans felt the British would attack. And so they prepared accordingly, defending them with as many men as they could. On the evening of August 26, 1776, the British forces mobilize. Two units march northwards towards two of the passes. One unit, though, moves east, goes the long way around, totally away from the action. These forces, the first two, meet the American defense in the hills of Greenwood Cemetery and today's Prospect Park. The first in a watermelon patch, and the second a group of Hessians in the, the Flatbush Pass, which is today on the run around Prospect Park if you ever go there. These two forces exchange fire th well through the evening into the next day until about 9 o'clock in the morning. And then at that moment, the military drums echoed through the hills as a column of 10,000 men descended onto the American forces. They surrounded them on three sides, a classic flanking maneuver designed to overwhelm your opponent. The three columns of the British and Hessian forces merged into one. And the Americans turned around and came into either Hessian bayonets or British muskets. The thing is, the British, they didn't want to fight. They were hoping to force a surrender so that things could go back to the way they were. That was why they tried to overwhelm their forces and surprise them, and it totally worked. The Americans didn't know what to do. And the Americans, I might add, were completely unprepared. They had terrible guns, which they brought themselves, and most of them did not have uniforms. They had hunting shirts. Only the most elite unit from Maryland had uniforms and proper guns. But while they didn't have much, the Americans had a cause, and so they were going to fight for it. And having a cause and looking for freedom meant there was no surrender. And so the only two possibilities were escape or death. But they s were surrounded by a huge army, a massive wall, and an impassable creek. And so what happened next is nothing less than the bloody chaos of open war. Near all of this fighting was the old stone house of Gowanus, a replica of which sits today at Fifth Avenue and Third Street, less than a mile from here. It was an old Dutch mansion with thick stone walls, and the British had taken it over with 2,000 men. And it was from there that all of the shooting was coming from, where the strongest hold of the British forces were. Now, one brave but foolhardy American general, nicknamed Lord Sterling, but his real name was William Alexander, he saw that the only way for the rebel forces to escape was to cross the impassable Gowanus Creek, there being no other way to go. But he also knew that in order to protect the last of his men from the British would be to take that house. So essentially, he planned a suicide mission. Sterling gathered the remaining elite forces from Maryland, today known as the Maryland 400, and they got together into one small group and attacked the Old Stone House. Three separate waves, eventually knocking the British out of their position despite being outnumbered. Many, many, many of these soldiers died. Walt Whitman, great poet of the American experience, can describe this moment far better than I can. And this excerpt from his poem, the, Centen the Centenarian Story, from his indelible Leaves of Grass. I tell not now the whole of the battle, but one brigade early in the forenoon ordered forward to engage the redcoats. Of that brigade I tell, and how steadily it marched, and how long and well it stood confronting death. Who do you think it was marching steadily, sternly confronting death? The brigade of the youngest men, 2,000 strong, raised in Maryland and Virginia, most of them known personally to the general. Jauntily forward they went, with quick step towards Gowanus' waters, till of a sudden unlooked for by defiles through the woods, gained at night, the British advancing, rounding in from the east, fiercely playing their guns. The brigade of the youngest was cut off and at the enemy's mercy. The general watched from this hill. They made desperate, repeated attempts to burst their environment, then drew very close together, co very compact, their flag flying in the middle. But oh, from the hills, how the cannon were thinning and thinning them. It sickens me yet, that slaughter. Washington clearly lost the battle that day. 
they were completely overwhelmed. And the Washington, uh, he, he was utterly unprepared. It's mostly his fault. The strategies were terrible, and he questioned them up until the moment that they were enacted. But there was one thing that redeems the whole situation, one fact that makes this day important in our lives, and that is that when the British chased the Americans down to the Gowanus Creek and the Americans crossed, a lot of them dying along the way, the British stopped. They stopped. They said, we've been running all day, and we haven't had lunch yet. And we're going to get them eventually. And so they sat down and had a meal. Now, of course, uh, this moment, this barrier of the Gowanus, allowed the Americans to have a day and a half. And during that time, they organized a daring, dead in the night escape across the East River, getting there before the British even knew what was happening, allowing the American army to reconstitute so that they could fight another day. And this loss forced Washington to re-examine his entire strategy. It was his first as commander of the American army. And he had, he, had, he had to change the way that he looked at the British and warfare itself in the unique arena that we call the United States of America. But I can't help but wonder, what if there was no Gowanus Creek? No boggy barrier blocking the British. I mean, is it so presumptuous to suggest that if there was no Gowanus Creek, we might have been divided and conquered? Historians may be infuriated by the suggestion, but is it so, so ridiculous to suggest without the Gowanus Creek, there would be no America? <laughs>